Hi, everybody. Hey, nerds. So a lot of nerds in the East Bay. Amazing. Dang. I'm here to talk about what I've been doing for the last 37 years, which is doing the day-to-day -day running of Survival Research Lab. The company I made up back in 1979 because I had a lot of interest in science, technology, uh, engineering, but I also had an extreme aversion to doing anything practical that would ever make any money for anybody, including me. And so I came up with a plan that would allow me to use all of those kinds of skills and, and allow me an excuse to have access to all the kind of tools and equipment that it takes to build complex machines and robots. And uh, I call this Survival Research Labs. And I'm going to show you a little, uh, I call it like an SR uh, Baraka. <laughs> you know, you, you build a bunch of these, you know, a mix of complicated and simple robots and, and, and sort of create enough of them so that you can uh, create kind of an imaginary world inhabited only by machines and robots. There's never any human performers in any of these shows. It's all done remotely, it's all done in real time. There's no do-overs. If you screw it up, that's it. The show's <laughs> over. There's been about 55 or 60 of these shows over the years. That's in one movie, Bitter Message of Hopeless Grief. There's all kinds of different machines. This is the smallest machine I've ever made here. This machine here. But, uh, so I've, I've done 55 of these shows all around the world. And, uh, you know, basically just trying to figure out what kind of a story you can tell with machines. Really trying to, I, you know, I try to just, I try to uh, listen to the technology, listen to the, the equipment, the machines. Uh, I give them enough of a personality that you can think of them as if they're alive in some way. And then I try to create shows based on how I interpret their characters that I create in the way that I combine the elements that comprise them. And then you think up a theme for the show. There's all kinds of different themes. Dangerous, disturbing, uh, let's see. Deliberately false statements, extremely cruel practices, uh, you know. Uh, what is another one? A cruel and relentless plot to pervert the flesh of beasts to unholy uses. So there's all kinds of fun you can have with titles and stuff. But, uh, you know, we are here at Nerd Night. I mean, this is the kind of exciting part, really. The, when it boils down to it, building this kind of stuff is just an ul the ultimate pain in the ass. Just, you know, most people that build things, they get paid for it. I don't get paid for it. None of the people who work with me at SRO get paid for it. We all do it because we think it's fun to do something that has never going to have any practical value. Nobody's ever going to want to buy. But people will love to come to go see. You know, making an SRL machine and using it in a show is more along the lines of launching a, a rocket. You really only get one chance, and if any one of 10,000 things are wrong, it's not going to work. And uh, when things blow up in SRL shows, it's on purpose. But in the real world, you know, when you're building something and it's happening in real time, you don't really get a second chance. So, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the excitement of it and part of the reason that uh, we're able to attract the type of engineers and uh, the resources that we can put in play to stage these productions. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of machines I've been working on recently. Uh, one of which is this machine here, which is the track robot. And uh, basically, the track, ro the, the track robot here uh, is, it's always been envisioned as sort of just a platform for testing things. Back in the late 90s, before anybody even considered it, we were using the track robot with a computer on it and wireless to be able to have people log in just remotely on the web from anywhere and run the track robot in real time all over San Francisco. We ran it all over Tokyo. This was in 1997 and 1999. We were one of the first people to ever do that. And then we, of course, moved on to running, letting people run lethal machinery, like the pitching <laughs> machine, which is a 6,000 pound machine that shoots uh, two by four boards at 200 miles an hour and launches two per second. We were having people run that remotely. Who knows, I don't know who they were. They were logging into the NTT website and running that in downtown Tokyo. 
shooting shooting boards five or six hundred feet in downtown Tokyo. And we don't know who they were. We were just kind of there to hit the kill switch if they aimed at the wrong thing. So the track robot has always been kind of, uh, it's more of a utilitarian type robot. Um, you know, like I said, it was made in around 99, mostly me and Chris Bourne, a, a Swiss, our best Swiss machinist who moved back to Switzerland. But uh, the control on it was built by this brilliant Japanese guy who like made this fantastic control in like a few weeks and it was really complicated. And he, him and Eric Paulos, who's at University of UC Berkeley now, they did the web interface. And this was back when you had to build everything when you were trying to do that stuff. So this guy just disappeared. The control broke and he just disappeared. So we had to, uh, you know, we were faced with a machine that wasn't working anymore. So what I did is I rebuilt it and I'm using it as a platform now for a 3D remote uh, telepresence for our shows. And I've got an Oculus Rift system set up here with, a, uh, with what's called a transported 3D, which is a box that does uh, which does real-time conversion of the two video streams into field sequential HDMI that then goes out to the Oculus Rift. And that's actually non-trivial. Another interesting thing is, uh, you know, at SRL we always try to make use of, you know, we, we try to borrow ideas from other, you know, the military, from the commercial world, and from the world of science. But also, uh, you know, from the world of sort of hobbyists, it's actually gotten kind of interesting. Uh, for instance, the Oculus Rift, which is sort of a gamer thing, you'd think, right? Well, the interesting thing is a few people thought about, well, you know, the Oculus Rift is cool, but you have to have a stupid computer connected to it to do anything. And I read about people trying to, like, get a laptop and program a bunch of crap in C++ and all that stuff. Well, someone else was thinking the same thing. They put up a Kickstarter thing, and they said, we're going to get a couple really fast FPGAs. We're going to, I'm going to build a little box that converts the two composite streams into field sequential HDMI in real time and does the head tracking. And then they built it. They got money from Kickstarter and they built the thing in like two or three months and then put it out for sale, well documented. You get a telepresence system that two years ago would have cost about a hundred thousand bucks. It's really nice. And it's all plug and play. Like literally this video system, I, I, I started working on it six hours ago. I plugged everything in and turned on the switch and it worked. That's pretty good. A lot of good researching comes out of just really carefully understanding and reading and, and adding on and using other elements that other people have invented, like for instance, uh, this system. So what I'm gonna uh, do here is I'm gonna run it for a little bit and then I'm gonna talk about some other machinery here. My kid's gonna help me here, Jake Eddy. <laughs> without a three fingers game can because you know what? Three fingers are all you need. If you got three fingers, you're not a gimp. If you have three fingers, you're not disabled. If you have three fingers, you got it going on. You can do anything. You can you could do anything. You could change the world if you weren't lazy so lazy. So the
this uh, this gripper which is it's called an under actuated gripper basically there's only one actuator in this but it, you can just scroll through them but it uh, there's only one actuator for each finger but it automatically you know it uh, because of the way the four bar linkages are set up on the fingers it's automatically compliant with almost anything you can try to grab with it so if you want to buy one of these they're about eighteen thousand dollars but you know what it's pretty easy to copy them. It's pretty simple. All you got to do is make one finger. Once it's in the CNC, you just push the button. You can make as many as you want. That's what's going to go on the front of this thing. And it'll be able to rotate up and down, uh, you know, sideways. So you can mix chemicals with it, or you can uh, grab people with it. One of the things I was going to do with it, I got asked to do a show at the battery, and. Uh, it, that never really happened, but uh, one of the things, I, well, maybe it was, they didn't like the idea of what I wanted to do, but I wanted to just sit in a room and drive this through the battery and grab people, but have plants in there. That people, you know, it's like a club, right? So I have plants in there that people wouldn't uh, do. You can drive this one out, okay? But don't hit anybody, okay? This, this, stick, this stick makes it, that's, that's forwards, that's backwards, that's... And that's turned the other way. He's got it. Yeah. Whoa. But uh, the idea would be to drive it through the building and then uh, you know come up to people and grab somebody. You know, grab somebody and like you know grab their pants and throw them to the ground with it. And then they would just kind of laugh and think, oh, that was kind of fun. You know. And then just go about you know get up off the floor and continue drinking. And so of course anybody who's watching it would have just thought, oh my god, that robot just knocked that guy over, and like, and, and everyone, he just thought it was cool, that's weird, right? And look, it's easy, even my kid can drive this thing. Again, this is the smallest machine. So, anyway, this is, this is one of the machines, this, just, this was just a collection of parts about four or five days ago, and now it's a functioning machine that my 10-year-old can drive. A little bit of work and the video system will be set up and working even better than it does now. So we've been asked to do a big show at Fort Mason, which uh, as part of a big international theater company, the San Francisco uh, International Art Festival, which is actually just a theater festival. It's not really, it's theater arts. And so uh, they are having us do a big show there outside. Uh, they'll be selling tickets in March for it. So we're trying to get a bunch of stuff ready for that. Uh, a bunch of new machines. Uh, there's a lot of things no one around here will have ever seen. This being one of them. But another another one of the machines is uh, well, there's the there's the whistle. Uh, let's let's look at the the Motor Man flamethrower uh, movie, the video. There's a video there. This is a uh, this is a small high density flamethrower. It's got a 60 horsepower two stroke engine on it, and a really a nice efficient fan and uh, it weighs about 90 pounds and so this will mount on the end of a Motorman UP50 robot arm and the robot arm will be waving it around while it's making a 25 foot long flame. A smoke test is something you do with flamethrowers, at least I've always done it. What you do is you run smoke through them and where the smoke goes non-linear you, you can get about, you got about 10% more uh, flame length than when you see the smoke going non-linear. So you can see it's out at about 20 feet, so then that means you probably get a flame out of about 20 feet, 25 feet. So, <laughs> this, there you go. So, this entire project 
sort of similar to the track row, but the track row was built around, you know, set, trying to set up an Oculus Rift system for it. The whole idea for this flamethrower was built around go up to, uh, yeah, there's the, there's, oh yeah, there's the Moto Man arm, there's the UP50 arm, you see we've got it armored, it's got aluminum armor, actually armor off a Bradley fighting vehicle, it's genuine aluminum armor, and so, that, all that stand is gone, and you just have, all you have is the tube and the motor mounted on the end of that effector there. The idea of doing a really great flamethrower came actually from studying atomization research, and what, what I ended up, the end of all atomization research, which is the key to making a really good flamethrower, you've got to get the particles down, the fuel particles as small as you can, because I use diesel fuel for my flamethrower, I don't use I don't use those funky protein burning in flamethrowers, those evanescent, insulting flames that, that they create noxious gas flames. I use actual real heavy fuel. And so uh, the important thing is atomizing. Like I've come up with a number of different novels, but I looked around at the research and I said, I've got to come up with something new. Every new jet engine uses macro spray nozzles. So I started calling around to try to order them. Guess what? Has anybody ever heard of ICAR before? These are ICAR regulated nozzles. So I thought there's one guy, you have to go through one guy. One guy, Tim Aiken. Those little spray nozzles there, right? And I said, I was thinking these are going to be like 500 bucks each, so I need a dozen of them. And I said, well, how much are these? He goes, oh, they're $50 each. And I was like, really? That's pretty cheap. And so, I knew there was a catch. It goes to Parker Hannafin, and then Parker Hannafin has to clear me to purchase these things. So that was about a week ago, so I'm expecting you to get clearance really soon. One of the things that I've experimented with over the years is really, really extremely intense sound fields. These sound fields that you would never experience outside of an SRL show. And so, in the interest of that, uh, I took this dead engine here, and I ran the jet engine through a, you can go to the next one there. I ran the jet engine through a special type of whistle. What's interesting about it is it's a, it's a design, uh, it's a design by a French uh, engineer. He wanted to make a whistle that the louder you blew in it, the louder it got. And so he invented this dual chamber whistle. And that's what this is designed, uh, design is based on. So, it's got, uh, you know, it's got a 160 horsepower jet engine, so maybe 200 pounds of thrust. So that's running into this, uh, into this big dual chamber whistle, about 6 feet across, coming out that match horn, and uh, putting out, uh, you know, maybe 80 or 90, 100 kilowatts of sound at exactly 156 hertz. With very, the only overtones you're hearing is just in the jet engine, so. That does all kinds of really interesting things with shows. We, we used it in LA uh, for a show in 20, the end of 2012, and if you get like within 20 or 30 feet of it, or if you're between buildings, which we were there, and the nose, sound the nose, move around, you know, basically you're, it's, you make, it makes you feel like you're a ball of paper, crum a piece of paper crumpled into a ball. It's basically overstimulating the ends of your nerves. At the end of the show, you know, in the script, the guy, the guys who were running it, the group who was running it, uh, the script called for them to run it for the last five minutes continuously, and they ran off and on for the last five minutes. And I'm like, after the show, I was like, that was great, you guys. I'm like, why didn't you run that thing for five minutes? You can't run that thing for five minutes straight if you're next to it. It's the most disturbing thing. It's like, it makes you know, it makes you want to die. So we do it. And I'm like, okay. But, uh, but the great thing about these kinds of devices is there's a lot of really good research out there, mostly that the military did, because they were concerned about what the soldiers turning to jelly because they were around big rocket engines and stuff like that. So they put soldiers in chambers and then uh, basically subjected them to really much, much higher levels of sound. This, this thing measured one meter from the, uh, the face, puts out around 138 decibels at 156 hertz. Now, if that was at a, low, a higher frequency, that would be very bad for your ears and very dangerous, but because it's at a, at a low frequency, it's actually pretty safe. But 
There's a lot of literature out there. There are a number of uh, experiments that people did subjecting people to those sound fields for hours and giving them IQ tests. And one of the interesting things is that your IQ will go down about 20%. So anyway, that's it for us. I hope I've nerded out enough for everybody and I can take some questions. Hundreds of them. <laughs> the spine robot. Let's talk about the spine robot. The spine robot, again, one of those things that was just, I saw this kind of weird rope that the military was using to replace all their steel cable with special forces. And I was like, you know what? You can actually make a robot with tendons with rope like that. And, uh, and so I came up with the whole idea. Now it's on a mobile car that drives around, goes up and down and everything like that. So that, that robot's designed to throw things. You can pick up a 10 pound thing and throw it about 35 feet with it. No one else has got a robot that throws things. I'm the only one. Except Boston Dynamics. They have a, they put an arm on one of their robots and threw a cinder block with it. You know what? I made a video of that thing throwing a cinder block further than their freaking dog. Take that, $10 million robot people. Suck it. Okay. Yeah. So if I go to the, the SRI.org, we have been online since 1993. We had a website since 1993, believe it or not. You can go there and all this information is going to be released there. You'll be able to actually buy tickets on March 7th for starting March 7th. And this is funded entirely by tickets, so one more question. Good, you should have a healthy respect for machines and people too, you know. Everything. What's in, you know, there could be a bomb in the garbage can, you know. Uh, that clock, that clock might have three cameras in it at the, at the decimal points of the numbers. You never know. So, I guess that's it. Thank you all very much. So just as a reminder, there's a scavenger hunt, there's lots of activities downstairs, there's still a big drink for sale, and uh, in about 40 minutes or so, there's going to be an awesome planetarium show with Jonathan Brayman. So enjoy the rest of your evening.